are fighting for the future Thank of you, the Senator. Great Barrier Reef. The time for Senator's statements has expired. We'll move the question time. Senator Cash. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. On page 52 of the government's regulatory impact statement for their Industrial Relations Bill, when trying to work out the bargaining cost for medium businesses, the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations calculates that $273,700 divided by 15.2 is $12,878. Can you please confirm that the correct figure should be $18,006? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Cash. Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Well, I knew if I waited long enough, the shadow minister for industrial relations would be allowed to ask a question about uh, Senator industrial Watt, relations. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Order on my left. Order on my left. Senator Watt, please continue. Thank you. you know, it, is, it is always good to have a question about industrial relations from uh, the minister whose office leaked, leaked a police raid on union officers who presided over conflict in the industrial relations system and wants to drag us back into that conflict situation. It's Senator always Watt. good to get a question about Senator IR Watt. from the whiteboard warrior Senator over there, Senator Watt. Cash. And you'll Senator be shocked Watt. to hear. Resume your seat. Order on my left. Senator Watt, I will direct you to Senator Cash's question, please. Senator Watt, please continue. Thank you. So, uh, Senator Cash, always good to hear from you. But the one thing I can guarantee is that when Senator Cash opens her mouth about industrial relations, you can guarantee it's going to be a scare campaign based on lies. And yet again, she's doing it again. The actual, uh, the actual Watt, facts here. Please resume your seat, Senator Cash. Relevance, uh, President, you have already directed the minister Thank to you. my question. I would ask that you again draw his Thank attention you, Senator to Cash, the question. And I will do. I will indeed direct the minister to your question. Thank you, Senator Watt. Thank you, President. And in fact, I was directly answering Senator Cash's question by referring to the fact that she had, yet again she was coming out with a scare campaign based on lies. Uh, Senator Watt. That was the question. Senator Watt. Please resume your seat. Uh, just a moment, Senator Birmingham. If I uh, direct the minister back to the question, I would expect those that are asking the question to at least be quiet so we can all hear the answer. Senator Birmingham. President, indeed, it was your two directions which I welcome to the minister back to the question. And each time he has flouted that by continuing with the theme of simply reflecting upon the opposition rather than dealing with the very specific relevant detail of the question. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I had just directed the minister back to the question and there was so much noise on my left, I couldn't even tell you what the minister said and he had just risen to his feet. He's well aware that I've directed him twice and if we can have quiet, we might all be able to hear the answer. Senator Watt. Uh, as opposed to what Senator Cash is saying, the facts here are that small businesses will be excluded from the single interest stream, so will not be forced to bargain. Small um, businesses. Senator Watt, please resume well, your seat. Uh, Senator Watt. Uh, Senator <laughs> Senator thank you. Cash. I'm happy to go. Thank you very much, President. The question again: relevance. The bargaining cost for medium businesses. You clearly don't even know what a small, uh, thank you, medium Senator or Cash, large business is. a debating point. It's not a point of order. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. Small businesses will have access to Small order. businesses will have access to the cooperative workplaces stream. Uh, this point comes across from well. Uh, Senator Watt, you really you don't want to see. When you've quite finished on your left, you have one of your own senators on her feet. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, on relevancy, maybe uh, the shadow minister could table the regulatory impact uh, statement to McKenzie, assist the Senator Mackenzie, that is not a debating point. Please resume your seat. Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, President. Small businesses will have access to the cooperative workplaces stream, which is designed to be a low-cost option for businesses without a dedicated human resources capacity. We've seen over the last 24 hours Senator Cash hyperventilating about information in this in this uh, Senator Watt. Uh, 
I'm going to ask you to withdraw. The okay, I withdraw hyperventilating. We've, sen we've seen Senator Cash going on and on and on, as she is prone to do, about information contained in a RIS and trying to argue that this shows that small businesses will be subject to a major Order. cost when, in actual fact, most of them will have access to cooperative workplaces stream, which is a low cost option that most of them will take advantage of. It's more misrepresentation and Thank scare campaigns than Senator White, opposition. Your time has expired. Senator Cash, for a supplement. Thank you very much. Can you also confirm that as a result of the mistake, in other words, the RIS is wrong, the total bargaining cost for medium businesses is actually much higher? at over $80,000 and not the $75,148, according to your own government's formula. Minister Watt. Uh, thank, thank, you, thank you, President. Again, what we continually see from Senator Cash and her colleagues in the coalition is a misrepresentation of how the Minister bargaining Watt. system will work under Minister the government. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Order. You've barely asked the question. I've called the minister to his feet and there's so much noise, I'm having trouble hearing him. Please continue, Minister Watt. As I, thank you, President. As I was saying, we continually see uh, Senator Cash and her colleagues seize on facts and figures and then distort what they actually mean. The reality under the government's the, the, the reality is that under the government's proposal, most small businesses, and I know you're asking about medium-sized businesses, most small businesses will have access to the cooperative workplaces stream, and there are Order. various other routes for medium-sized businesses to take advantage of that will not include the kind of costs that the opposition is out there trying to scare people about. All through this debate, we have seen scare campaign after scare campaign from the opposition. First of all, it was going to ruin the mining industry, and then we realised everyone realised that it wasn't going to apply to most of the mining industry. Then it was going to promote strikes, and in actual fact, there's restrictions on strikes. Everything we've heard from the coalition is a scare campaign and blatantly wrong. Thank you, uh, Minister Watt. Senator Cash, second supplementary. Thank you. Is the figure of $1,278? as the bargaining cost for medium businesses as set out in the government's regulatory impact statement, right or wrong? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister. Thank you, President. Of course I can only go off the figures that are in the RIS. That is what they're for. But the point is, the point is that Order. every step Order. of this debate Every step of this debate, we have seen people from the coalition seize on figures and then misrepresent what they actually stand for. Everything we have heard from the coalition has been a misrepresentation of what the government is proposing to do through this multi-employer bargaining Order. and the various other changes. Please resume your seat, Senator. It's not up. Uh, Senator Watt, that's not helpful. I am asking those on my left to allow the minister to answer. Uh, in silence. Senator Cash, I've just drawn your attention to the noise in the chamber. Minister Watt, please continue. Uh, thank you, President. As I say, everything we hear from the opposition uh, in this debate is a misrepresentation and a scare campaign. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that they will stop at absolutely nothing uh, to stop from wages from growing. A 10-year government that kept wages deliberately low, Order. that kept productivity low and is fighting to the death to stop changes being made to our industrial relations system that will actually deliver better wages for workers and better productivity for businesses. That's what this is really about, is that the coalition wants to keep the old system in place that kept wages low uh, thank and kept you, productivity Minister low. Thank you, Your time has expired. Senator Payman. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister outline how the Albanese government is supporting Australian households during these challenging economic times? Minister. Thank you very much. And I thank Senator Payman uh, for the question. Uh, sh Senator Payman is right. In these challenging times, what Australians needed from their government was a budget that was responsible, that was right for the times and which readied us for the future. The primary focus on the budget aside from delivering on our commitments to the Australian people, was managing the inflationary pressures that Australians are expecting, ex experiencing right now. That's why, why at the heart of the budget was our five-point plan for cost of living relief, to provide some support, which div delivers an economic dividend but doesn't put extra pressure on inflation. The hard reality is that after nearly a decade of division, denial and delay, our economy wasn't as strong 
or resilient as we need it to be for the challenges we face. But our budget begins to turn that around by investing in the capabilities of our people and the capacity of the economy. <coughs> Fee-free TAFE and more university places. The National Reconstruction Fund for new, well-paid jobs in new industries. Investing in cleaner, cheaper, more reliable energy to deal with the extraordinary energy market mess that we inherited. And budget that pays for things that Australians value the most, better health care, better Medicare and better aged care. Above all, the budget marked the end of a wasted decade, a decade where we've seen energy chaos, an aged care crisis, a skill shortage, stagnant wages, a trillion dollars of debt with nothing to show for it. That's the mess that we inherited, the mess we're cleaning up in this budget with those key measures which go to investing in uh, the economic uh, or the productive side of our economy by training people with the skills they need for the future, creating opportunity, supporting new industries um, where they need an extra hand uh, and getting the uh, transformation to a decarbonised economy on the right foot. Thank you, Minister. Senator Payman, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, can the minister outline how the budget will ease cost of living pressures for households? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, we are easing the cost of living pressure on households by investing in cheaper childcare for more than 1.2 million uh, families. Um, important legislation that passed this chamber yesterday and has. Uh, has also been dealt with in the House this morning, helping more people, overwhelmingly women, back into the workforce if they choose to, and enough to increase uh, um, the number of full-time workers by 37,000 extra full-time workers, by expanding paid parental leave to 26 weeks by 2026, by making medicines cheaper, the biggest cut to the cost of medicines in the 75-year history of the PBS by our investments in more affordable housing, tens of thousands of new social and affordable homes, more support for people to buy their own home, a new national housing accord bringing governments and the private sector together to be build the homes we desperately need. Again, after a decade of neglect, the Commonwealth is back at the table on housing, wanting to work in partnership with, with state and territory colleagues and private providers to deliver the housing options that Australians need. Thank you, Minister. Senator Payman, second supplementary. Can the minister outline why it's important that the government provide support that is responsible and does not put additional pressure on inflation? Minister. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Payman for the supplementary. The budget was carefully calibrated to deal with the inflation challenge in our economy. We knew we had to act differently from our predecessors to avoid making the inflation problem in our economy worse and forcing the RBA to go even harder on interest rates. The October budget returned $114 billion of tax upgrades to the budget over the forward estimates. This is the government making a decision to return 99 per cent of the upward tax revisions for the next two years when the inflation challenge is most severe and 92 per cent over the forward estimates. This compares to the Howard Costello um, government's average of around 30 per cent of the, um, of the tax upgrades and the former government's average of around 40 per cent. It was an important decision that we made. Um, Treasury has analysed the economic impact of the overall revenue upgrades in the October budget instead of being transferred to households rather than returned to the budget, and that would have put significant pressure on inflation. Thank you, Minister. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. The regulatory impact statement of the government's industrial relations legislation says the department has costed bargaining consultants by using an article entitled, How Much Should I Charge as a Consultant in Australia? from a website called authentic.com.au. The author of that article is described on that website as a cross between business strategist, modern day spiritual healer, and self development expert. Benjamin J. Harvey is as comfortable working Order. with shamans to strategists, psychics to sale reps, healers to homemakers, Buddhists to businessmen, mediators Order. to mediators. Do you think that's an acceptable way to calculate such costings? I'm not going to call the minister until there's silence. And I expect senators to listen in silence. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, I am aware of this. Um, I am aware of this uh, incident, 
And uh, I also am aware that a departmental spokesperson from the department has already addressed this point uh, by saying that the link was used as part of an internal desktop review which used a range of online sources to determine an indicative cost as part of the RIS. This included websites such as the AFR. Do you have an issue with that one? Uh, it included Payscale. Do you have an issue with that one? Uh, it included Talentcom and LinkedIn. Do you have issues with those as well? Uh, and, and the departmental spokesperson has gone on to say that it was incorrect to use the link as being the only source referenced in that section of the RIS. Um, the department apologises. Would you resume your seat, please? Order, Senator Cash and Senator Canavan, when I'm calling the Senate to order. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. Um, I didn't know the opposition objected to the AFR and LinkedIn and Talent.com and Payscale and things like that, but apparently they do. Because the, the truth here is that the, the opposition, what they really object to, what they really object to is any change to an industrial relations system that has kept wages low, uh, kept Watt. productivity low and impeded Senator economic Watt. growth. That's please what resume your seat. Order. Please continue, Minister. Thank you. There is oh, nothing Minister that gets Watt. the coalition more excited Minister than keeping Watt. wages low. Please resume Sorry. your seat. Seriously, Senator Cash, I've just called the chamber to order, and the very minute the senator gets back on his feet to answer the question, you interject very loudly once again. I will ask you to listen in quiet. Please continue, Minister Watt. Thank you. As I say, there is nothing that gets the coalition going more than the prospect of keeping wages low. That's what they did for 10 years they were in government, and that's what they're determined to do, even though they lost the last election, even when our government got a mandate to get wages moving again. This mob over here are so determined to hold workers back from getting a pay rise that they will, they will continually oppose it. They will come up with scare campaign after scare campaign, anything at all to keep wages low. And why? Because it was a deliberate feature of their, desi of their economic policy, and they are determined to pursue that in opposition, just as they did it for 10 years in government. You know what will actually make our economy stronger? And that is higher wages and higher productivity. And you know how we are going to do that? By delivering these industrial relations reforms that the people of Australia voted for and this mob still haven't woken up to, and they are pursuing the old fights and the old conflict to hold wages low. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator McGrath, first up. Thank you. The same regulatory impact statement on page 46 references an article entitled How Much Do Payroll Services Cost? on a website called Bark.com, which lists its most popular services as dog and pet grooming, dog training, dog walking, life coaching, limousine hire, magicians and private investigators. Is this an acceptable source for a government department to use to calculate bargaining costs for businesses? Thank you, Senator McGrath. Uh, when there is silence, I will call the minister. Minister. Thank you, President. As I was saying in my previous answer, the departmental spokesperson has acknowledged that it was incorrect to use the link as being the only source referenced in that section of the RIS. However, as I've already said, uh, the, the work that the department did also included the AFR, Payscale, Talent.com and LinkedIn. And frankly, it probably would have been, been more wise uh, of the department to reference those ones rather seat. than the uh, Senator McGrath, you've asked your question. I would expect you to listen in silence, along with Senator Cash and Senator Birmingham. Please continue, Minister. So I've got a, a short of that. Please continue, Minister. Thank you. Um, thank you, President. Um, so, as I say, I, fr I frankly think it would have been a better idea uh, for the department to use some of those other more reputable sources on its website rather than the one that they chose to do. They've apologised for their error, but that doesn't deny the fact that in the doing this work they relied on a number of other reputable sources, unless if we're learning today that the opposition also has a problem with the AFR, LinkedIn and the other various sites that I used. Um, but, as I say, we're going to hear this all week. We're going to hear attack after attack from the coalition on wage rises, uh, despite the fact that the Australian people voted for them. Frankly, I think it would be a— uh, Thank you, Minister. Senator Birmingham. Senator Watt keeps misleading the chamber with his reference uh, to what the Australian no. people voted for. Senator the bill Birmingham. he's talking about the Senator people didn't— Senator Birmingham, please resume your seat. Order. 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 When order, 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 Senator Birmingham, that is not a point of order, Senator Wong. Uh, 
the, I would ask you to not allow the leader to the leader to continue to debate a point when there is no point of order. Uh, he knows, and I know he wants to throw some meat to the back bench on an ideological issue, but he knows that is not a point of order. Thank you, he, Senator you Wong. ought to sit him down, President. My submission is you ought to sit him down Thank earlier. You. Order. Uh, Senator Wong, I would have sat Senator Birmingham down, but there was so much disorder in the chamber, he could not hear me. I would once again ask all senators to refrain from shouting out. It's not a football match. It is the Senate chamber where a little bit of rowdiness is fine, but not the pitch at which it is currently being delivered. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. I know it hurts the opposition to realise that the Australian vote people voted for wages Thank to get you, moved again, but they did, and we're expired. doing it. Uh, Senator McGrath, second supplementary. Why won't the minister take responsibility for the mistakes in this so-called mistakes in the in the RIS document instead of blaming junior department officials? Take responsibility. Order. Shame on you. Order. Order. Senator McGrath. Order. 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 Senator Wong. Order. Senator McGrath, I would ask you to be silent. You've asked your question. Senator Cash, I would ask you to be silent. And Senator Wong, I will ask you to be silent as well. Order, Senator McGrath. I've just directed you to be quiet. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. As I was saying uh, in my earlier answers, a departmental uh, spokesperson has taken responsibility for that error. And, uh, Senator and Watt, please resume your seat. Order on my left. Senator Mackenzie. Order. 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 Senator Mackenzie, I'm asking you to be quiet as well. Minister Watt. So, in addition to the department taking responsibility, I have taken responsibility as the minister uh, responsible by saying, frankly, I think that was the wrong thing to do. But isn't it ironic that the party of no hoses is here lecturing us about taking responsibility? We endured years of the problem. Senator former... Watt, please resume your seat. Order. Senator McGrath. Please continue, Senator Watt. Thank you, President. Um, well, we've learned what really gets these people going. It's cutting wages and taking responsibility. They're the things that they get wound up about. So the party that sat by under a Prime Minister whose only famous quote was that he didn't hold a hose now want to come and talk to us about taking responsibility? Over the entire three years or four years that Scott Morrison was the Prime Minister of this country, there's only one thing he took responsibility for, and you know what it was? It was keeping wages low. That's what he took responsibility for, because that was a deliberate design feature of your economic policy. That's taking responsibility, keeping wages down low. We're going to do the opposite. We're going to get wages moving again, and we're going Thank to lift you, productivity Minister, while we're at it. Your time has expired. Senator Thorpe. Order. 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 I have Senator Thorpe on her feet <laughs> waiting to ask a question. She has the right to be heard in silence. Please continue, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Pre President. In recent weeks, there have been numerous. Uh, Senator Thorpe, it's our customary to start with who your question is to. Oh, of course it is. I got sidetracked. Uh, my question is to Minister representing the Minister for Youth, Senator Watt. In recent weeks, there have been numerous violent attacks against young First Nations people in this country. Our communities are scared. Our children are feeling unsafe. There has been little or no response by state, territory and federal governments. Why is addressing racial violence not a priority for this government? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Uh, Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Thorpe. Um, I don't think it's fair uh, for Senator Thorpe to suggest that this government uh, doesn't take these issues seriously. 
Uh, I would like to think that every member of this chamber has been appalled by some of the racial violence uh, and uh, alleged murder, bearing in mind that there's a court process yet to be gone through, particularly uh, uh, in relation to the incident in Perth, which was it was awful. Um, there's no other word for it, and it shouldn't be happening in this, in Australia. It shouldn't have happened in Australia at any period of our history, and it certainly shouldn't be happening now. Um, but it's not just me who's been saying this on behalf of the government. I well remember uh, the multiple comments that the Prime Minister has made uh, in recent weeks about these acts of racial violence. Uh, and as I say, I would hope that that is a position that is shared by all my members of this chamber. Um, the, I'm sure, Senator Thorpe, you are aware of uh, a range of actions that this government is taking uh, around matters involving youth justice, which um, disturbingly, again in this day and age, continue to have disproportionate uh, involvement of young First Nations people than they should. Uh, as a country, we haven't done a good enough job around uh, youth justice uh, for young Indigenous people, and they are being incarcerated at a far higher rate than should be acceptable to any of us in this country. Um, so, uh, but I, I do believe that this is an issue that the government takes seriously. Uh, we had money in the most recent budget to expand a range of services around youth justice, particularly in relation uh, to young First Nations people. Oh, sorry, Senator Thorpe. See, uh, my question is: Why is addressing addressing not yep. hand on heart feeling, you know, condolences and and understanding how hard it is for us. But my question is actually, how is yes, uh, what uh, is Senator Thorpe? It's not appropriate. The government to, doing to Senator address Senator Thorpe? It is not appropriate to repeat the question. You've made a point of order, uh, indicating to me that you believe the minister isn't being relevant. I don't agree with the point of order. The minister is being relevant, and I would ask him to continue. <coughs> Uh, thanks, President. Um, as I say, there, there were a range of programs that our government funded through the budget recently around youth justice programs for First Nations people. Uh, Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Thorpe. This is not about youth justice. This is about racial violence. It's not about the black kids uh, themselves. Senator Thorpe. It's about Senator the Thorpe. racists that are doing Senator this. Senator Thorpe, that's a debating point. You had a wide-ranging question. As I indicated to you on your previous point of order, the minister is being relevant. Please continue, minister. Well, I was coming to that, Senator Thorpe. In addition to the programs that we have uh, in relation to youth justice, um, I, I think that there have been a number of figures from this government who have been very vocal about uh, racial uh, violence being completely unacceptable uh, in our country, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to take advice from the relevant ministers as to what we might be more be, might Thank be doing you, in Senator that regard. Thank you, Senator White. Your time has expired. Senator Thorpe, first supplementary. Thank you, President. If you claim this is important, which we keep hearing all the words and no action, then what is the government doing to ensure that First Nations children in so-called Australia are kept safe from these racially motivated attacks? and are able to live out their birthright. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President. Um, as I was saying towards the end of my last answer, this government is uh, doing a range of work in relation to uh, racism and racist violence within our community. I'm aware, for instance, that the Human Rights Commission uh, is doing some work in this regard that is being supported by our government, uh, and there are a range of other uh, um, uh, departments within our government. Uh, I know it's not directly relevant to the point that you're making, but I know that uh, the Department of Home Affairs is doing work in this space in relation to racism, particularly against migrant Australians. Again, I accept that it's a different point, but a similar issue about how we're tackling racism within the community. Uh, and that's something that we intend to do a lot more of, because we don't want to see First Nations people uh, exposed to the kind of violence that we have, been, uh, have seen of late. Uh, as, and all I can do is repeat the fact that I think we all found that disturbing and we need to do much better as a country. Senator Thorpe, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Given that you won't support raising the age of legal responsibility to 14 and showing that you're more focused on locking our kids up than keeping them safe, how are you addressing systemic racism in police forces and government agencies that impacts so heavily on First Nations children? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Mm. Um, thank you, President. Um, the, the matter that you began with, Senator Thorpe, about the um, uh, criminal age of responsibility, the Attorney-General, Mr Dreyfus, has actually made that a standing item for discussion and action 
uh, at the Ministerial Council of all Attorneys General around the country. Um, there are some states that are more willing than others to look at this issue and to do something about this issue, and I know the Northern Territory is currently doing something about that issue. Um, but there are other states who aren't moving as quickly. But the fact that the, the Attorney General has got this on the agenda every meeting of, the, of his colleagues demonstrates that that's something that we want to be doing. Well, Senator Thorpe, um, the, the age of response, criminal responsibility is a, is a matter for states to determine. Uh, but, and, and we are demonstrating leadership uh, by putting it on the agenda for every ministerial Order, council Senator, uh, meeting. Uh, that is, uh, and that is how Commonwealth governments exercise leadership Senator is Henderson. by putting it on the agenda to put pressure on the states to, to start thinking about these issues Thank more. Thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Senator Polly. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. The government is making significant progress to diversify trade opportunities for the Australian businesses. Can the minister provide an update on the status of Australia's trade agreements with the United Kingdom and India? Uh, minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President. And can I thank uh, Senator Polly once again for her deep interest in this uh, subject uh, area? And, uh, uh, a subject uh, so important to her home state of uh, Tasmania. And it's important to say, I think, that after a decade of uh, the Liberal government, <coughs> almost a decade of the Liberal government, Australia was more dependent than ever on a single market for, uh, for our exports. To overcome this predicament, the uh, Albanese Labor government is progressing a trade policy agenda that creates opportunities for Australian businesses to gain new market access into major markets. This includes implementing trade agreements with two of our major trading partners, India and the United Kingdom. The Liberal government dropped the ball by failing That's to right. conclude parliamentary processes to implement the Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement and the Australia-India Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement. In contrast, this government, this government took an important step yesterday, deepening and diversifying our trading relations with India and the United Kingdom by passing legislation to implement these trade agreements. We want to continue to work closely uh, with the United Kingdom uh, and the Indian governments, and I've been in contact with both of those governments uh, overnight to ensure that all of the processes that we have started uh, and commenced and completed yesterday just just waiting just just waiting just waiting for for uh, royal assent just waiting for royal assent uh, we want to ensure that not only is everything that we've done at our side to complete these processes done on the other side thank you minister senator Polly, first supplementary a trade agreement with the European Union will further expand opportunities for Australian businesses, including at the agriculture sector. Can the minister provide an update on the progress of the trade negotiations with the EU? Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Farrell. <laughs> at least, at, sorry. At least I'm prepared to meet with them and discuss issues with them, which you never, ever, ever did. And I met Senator with them. Farrell. I met with eight of them Senator last Farrell. night. Senator I met. Resume your seat. Order on my left. Order. 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 When there is quiet, I will ask the minister to continue his answer. Oh, Senator Hume. Oh, Senator Henderson, sorry. Sorry, Senator Hume. Uh, there's so much noise, it's, it's hard to tell. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Thank you for that protection. <coughs> and uh, I should start by thanking uh, Senator Polly once again for that uh, insightful question. Um, now, despite many years of negotiations, the Liberal government failed to land a trade deal with the European Union. Now, why was that? Why was that? That why was that? Why did you fail to land an agreement? Why did New Zealand? Why did New Zealand get ahead of us with a free trade agreement? Because because of the former government, the Morrison government's 
disrespectful approach to a close ally. But I'm pleased to say negotiations are back on track and discussions, of course, have occurred with the Prosecco uh, producers, wonderful producers, both Australia and the Thank EU. You, Minister uh, Farrell, your time has expired. Senator Polly, second supplementary. President, the World Trade Organisation rules underpin global trade and trade agreements. I understand you met with the WTO Director General yesterday. Can you give the Senate an update on that engagement? Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. I thank uh, Senator Polly once again for her question. Uh, yes, um, yesterday, you're right, uh, Senator Polly. I had a, uh, a, uh, a great meeting with the uh, Director General yesterday. It was a very warm uh, and friendly uh, meeting, of course. Uh, she, uh, she's a great friend of uh, our former Prime Minister, Minister uh, Prime Minister Gillard. And her visit provided an opportunity to discuss how we can continue to work together to address the uh, challenges uh, facing the multilateral trading system. A key issue discussed was the need to ensure a pro properly, uh, properly functioning dispute settlement system. Uh, I also emphasised the importance of addressing uh, trade distorting agricultural subsidies. Uh, in recognition of the importance of the WTO uh, to Australia's economic resilience, Australia committed $5 million to help developing countries and least uh, developed countries access the Thank benefits you, of Your WTO time has expired. membership. Senator Hanson. The Minister representing the Minister for Communication, Senator Watt. In 2018, Australia Post CEO Christine Holgate secured a deal with the CBA, NAB and Westpac to pay $20 million each every year as a representation fee for Bank at Post to serve their customers. Will the minister confirm this fee has been halved in the new agreement to $10 million a year each? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Hanson, uh, for that question. I'll have to take the precise details of that question on notice. I don't, I don't have that information to hand. Uh, but uh, I know that many Australians right around Australia, particularly in rural or regional areas, depend very heavily uh, on Australia Post services. Uh, and that's something that we very much support. We, we for instance, stood very much against uh, the— yeah, well, Ah, Senator Rennick gets a go. His own side won't give him a go, so he's got to have a go during Senator Hanson's question. Um, the, um, so what I was actually about to say prior to Senator Rennick's interjection was that Labor has always stood against the privatisation of Australia Post, for example. Um, but the nature of Australia Post services is changing over the years. I know that they're increasingly moving towards parcel services rather than postage. Um, but they do provide a vital service to rural and regional areas in particular, uh, as well as servicing our cities increasingly with the parcel uh, business that they have op been operating. Uh, but Senator Hanson, I'm happy to come back to you on notice with the answer to your specific question uh, as soon as I get those details. Senator Hanson, first thank, supplementary. Yeah, thank you very much, because I appreciate that you don't know the, the answer to that, but I have been told on good advice that it is $10 million a year. Now, a lot of these, uh, local po these post offices actually rely on that money that they're making from that $20 million a year that was getting, made them viable to actually um, uh, you know, keep their doors open. So the banks are making billions of dollars profit a year. If this is the case, if they have actually dropped it to $10 million a year, what will your government do to address this? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Mr Watt. Um, thank you again, Senator Hanson. Um, obviously, uh, a number of these types of matters are ultimately decisions for the board of Australia Post rather than the government of the day, because it does have a degree of independence. However, uh, we are concerned uh, about the number uh, of outlets that are available, particularly in rural and regional areas, and I know this is an issue that you've taken up in the past uh, on the uh, uh, Senator Hanson. Um, currently, Australia Post, uh, for instance, has about 4,300 retail outlets across the country, and it has a le legislated requirement to maintain at least 4,000 
retail outlets. And as I was saying, I recognise, and I think everyone in our government recognises, that these post offices play a key role in communities around Australia. Uh, and as I've already reflected, th this is particularly true in regional Australia, where often you find that it's the Australia Post outlets that also serve as the banks uh, uh, um, and a range of e even of government services as well. So um, I know that uh, these Thank you, are Senator issues. White, your time Thanks. has expired. Senator Hanson, second supplementary. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but since the beginning of 2021, more than 200 branches of the big four banks have closed or have been announced they are closing, mostly in regional areas, with customers shunted to bank at post um, outlets. What is your government go to, going to do to counteract bank closures and lack of staffing happening across the country, mainly in rural and regional areas. So is the government actually going to start addressing this and pull the banks into line that they must provide the service um, thank that's you, necessary Senator to Hansen. Australia? Your time has expired. Minister Watt. Um, thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Hanson. I think we're probably straying outside uh, the, the responsibilities I have as a representing minister, let alone as the minister. So, um, but I'll do my best to answer the question. Um, Again, I, I am definitely concerned about the decreasing number of branches uh, that we see in retail banks across country areas in Australia, and I guess I particularly now see that, uh, that through my role as the Agriculture Minister. Uh, it was only last week that I was in uh, rural, I'm pretty sure the conversation happened in South Australia, about the impacts of bank closures uh, in those communities, and it places real pressure uh, on those communities when they can't uh, access those services. Actually, I remember now it was more I I was having the conversation. Um, so, the, um, so it is a problem. Um, I think banks do have a community obligation to provide services to their customers. Uh, and as we see those banks withdraw, that does also put more pressure on uh, Australia Post outlets. And that's, I know, what the fundamental point you're trying to make. But I'll come back to you with some more answers. Thank you, uh, Minister. Senator Brockman. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, uh -oh. Senator Watt. Uh -oh. I refer to the now Treasurer's comments on 21 November 2021, where the Treasurer said industry-wide bargaining was, and I quote, not part of our policy. Uh -oh. Given the government is trying to introduce industry-wide bargaining by stealth in its, in its extreme industrial relations legislation, Will the minister apologise to the Australian people for this broken promise? Uh, thank you, Senator Brockman. Minister. Well, what do you know? It's 2.42 p.m. on the broadcast. Wednesday on and we're on a broadcast day, and it's another false scare campaign about IR. Um, this is, is this the third we've had so far? I've lost track just about how many we've had in question time today. So, I'm not sure whether Senator Brockman knows that he is misleading people with what he's saying, but I'm here to help him. There is a distinction between industry-wide bargaining and multi-employer bargaining. Industry-wide bargaining involves a whole industry. Multi-employer bargaining involves multiple employers. They are different things. We are in favour of allowing employers and employees, where they choose, uh, to pursue multi-employer bargaining. Order. That is not the same as industry bargaining. It's in the name. Uh, so again, it's just another false scare campaign from an opposition uh, Senator White, that is. Please resume your seat, uh, Senator McGrath. Your Constant interjections are disorderly, as are yours, Senator Cash. I would ask you to listen quietly. Minister, please continue. Um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to the supplementary questions because we might get to our fourth and fifth scare campaigns in one question, ca uh, question time alone, because this one is yet another one that is completely baseless and completely misunderstands how industrial relations actually works in this country. So what we've got is a coalition that is so intent on running scare campaigns to stop wages Senator rising McGrath. that they are clutching at straws and making things up and misinterpreting how their own laws actually work in order to throw mud at a government that is trying to do something about wage rises. It's actually a little bit sad to watch uh, from the coalition uh, so, so completely misunderstand how industrial relations works uh, that they will be making up these kinds of things which anyone could just Fair look at how cash. those words operate industry-wide, multi-employer. They're actually kind of different concepts. You know what? Industry-wide is also different to single interest bargaining, which is another thing that we're providing for. They are completely different concepts, and what you're talking about is not part of the government's agenda, never has been part of the government's agenda. The only agenda this government has is to get wages moving again. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Brockman, first supplementary. 
A survey of businesses by the WA Chamber of Commerce and Industry has found nine in ten businesses would be damaged by measures in the Albanese government's extreme Shame. industrial relations bill, and Shame. four in five would be damaged by multi-employer bargaining. Businesses are saying it will make it harder to run a business and employ Order. Australians. It's not a scared campaign. They're scared. Why is the government turning its back on job Order. creators in Western Order. Australia? Order. Uh, before I call the minister, I'm going to ask senators on my left and right to be silent while the minister answers the question. Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Brockman. Well, hold the front page. Big Employer Group opposes wage rises and opposes changes to the IR system that enable wage rises. I mean, has it ever been any different? Has it ever been any different? Uh, and we know that over the last 10 years, some of those big business Senator groups were in, were in cahoots Senator with Watt. the coalition. Please resume your seat. Order. Please continue, Senator Watt. Thank you, President. No, so it's hardly a surprise that when we finally have a government in this country that wants to get wages moving again, that we say business, we see some business groups oppose it. But isn't it interesting that the government, Senator that the opposition, Cash. doesn't want to pay attention to those business groups that actually do support multi-employer bargaining? And as I was saying yesterday in the Senate inquiry, we had evidence from the executive director of the Community Childcare Association, which represents over 750. Oh, apparently we don't. We're not prepared to listen to community childcare centres. They don't get a voice in this. No, they are no good because they represent uh, employers of low Senator paid White, workers. They don't get a say. In your seat. Senator McGrath, I called twice for you to be quiet and you just ignored it. The minister has the right to give his answer in silence. Please continue, Minister Watt. So, yeah, apparently, if you are a business that provides childcare services, um, that's not a, that's not on it. You can't have your say. You also can't have a say uh, if, you're in, if you're involved in manufacturing and installation associations who support uh, what we're White, trying to do. Senator White, your time has expired. Senator Brockman, second supplementary. The same survey has found the government's radical industrial relations legislation will put 34,000 workplaces at risk of employer employing fewer staff in the years ahead if the changes proceed. Employers universally are saying these changes will make it harder to run a business and employ Australians. Why is the government pursuing policy changes that will see less jobs for Australians and will see even more job losses than already expected under this Thank government? Thank you, Senator Brockman. Your time has expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, President. Well, again, I am, I am shocked. I am shocked that an employer group that is out there telling its members that the sky is going to fall in if these changes go through, then goes and surveys its members and their members are scared. What a shock! What a shock that is. Now, Senator Brockman is talking about uh, our, our changes as being radical. So is it radical, Senator Brockman, that what we're trying to do is to make gender equity an objective of the Fair Work Act? Is it radical, Senator Brockman, uh, that what Senator we want to do Watt, is to ban secrecy? Senator Watt, I would ask you to address your answers sure. to the chair. And I would ask those on my left to be quiet. Senator Watt. Thanks, uh, President. President, I ask you, is it radical uh, to have a government that wants to ban pay secrecy clauses in employment contracts? I think it's not. Is it radical uh, that we have a government uh, that wants to ensure employers have a duty to prevent sexual harassment? How radical that is! What a radical proposal to do something about sexual harassment. Is it, is it radical to have a government that wants to make the sexual harassment dispute process fairer and more effective? How naughty and how radical of this government to want to do something about that? That's why Thank we're doing you, it, Minister. to look after Your workers and look after expired. businesses. Thank you. Uh, Senator Waters. I've called Senator Waters. Thanks, President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change, Senator Wong. Uh, the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology have today released the State of the Climate Report, and unsurprisingly it finds that the climate systems that touch on every aspect of our lives and our environment are changing before our very eyes. Our country has already warmed by 1.47 degrees. Fires, floods and cyclones are more intense. Extracting and burning coal and gas is the biggest cause of the climate crisis. Minister, do you support Australia's coal and gas export industry expanding? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister Wong. Well, uh, again, I will first respond to the State of the Climate report and, and say, uh, like 
uh, Senator Waters and, and many, are, and I hope most people with um, uh, who look at this issue rationally, and I'm afraid that doesn't include necessarily many opposite. Uh, it is a deeply concerning report. Uh, it, 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 a report that's released every two years. It shows an increase in extreme heat events, intense heavy rainfall, longer fire seasons, and sea level rise. Uh, it, it provides five. Uh, it, it shows, as you said, the Australia's land climate has warmed by an average of 1.47 degrees since national records began in 1910. And I heard again interjections from the other side saying, uh, "Rubbish." This is the Bureau of Meteorology and the CSIRO, and Senator I know you Rennie. like to, uh, you like to suggest they're part of some conspiracy. But this is what the science is telling us. This is what the science is telling us. But I'm actually Senator quite pleased Rennie. at the interjections because it shows, uh, reminds us yet again. Uh, why the frame that Senator Waters has put to me is not, is not the, the answer to what we have to deal with. It is not a single industry's fault. It is not a single employer's fault. It is not a single place's fault. We have to engineer a transition of the Australian economy and the global economy. And we have to do that together, and we have to do it from government. And for, for years we have been arguing for this, uh, and I am pleased. I am pleased. Uh, that we finally have a parliament in, bo in both chambers which does want to act on climate. And I also understand why it is that the, the Greens political party seeks to make this entirely about, entirely about one issue. It is about transitioning the whole of the economy. It is about reducing the emissions uh, that we produce. And it is part of doing what Minister Bowen did at the conference of the parties, which is being part of a global solution to what is a global problem. And no amount of finger pointing domestically for political purposes will yield the outcome that we want. Thank you, Minister Wong. Your time has expired. Senator Waters, first supplementary. Uh, thanks, President. I note that you conveniently didn't answer the aspect of the question about whether you support expanding the coal and gas export industry. Uh, however, I'll press on. Yesterday on Sky News, I'm informed uh, the managing director of Tamboran, a company that this government voted to give uh, $7.5 million to frack the Beedaloo Basin, uh, that managing director said they'll be able to pump gas for hundreds of years. Uh, Minister, do you want Australia to be pumping gas for hundreds of years? Uh, Minister Wong. Uh, th thank you. Uh, can I, uh, I, I, don't, I didn't see that interview, uh, so I won't. I'm sorry. Okay, well that's that's good to know. Um, uh, <laughs> genuinely, we have uh, at the um, what what I will we we, we do agree on something. Um, the position the government has been very clear about is that we will reduce our emissions by 43 per cent by 2030, uh, and we will aim to get to 82 per cent renewables by 2030. What I would also I would make this point I would make this point uh, is that the market is moving. The market is moving. It is moving domestically and it is moving internationally. And I know those opposite want to howl at the moon over this, but it is. And what that does show is that the reliance in the global energy markets uh, on fossil fuels over time to 2050 will reduce. Uh, so whatever individual companies might uh, thank say, you, Minister. Your time that has is expired. the reality. I'm, before I call Senator Waters, Senator Rennick, I have called you to order a number of times. This is Senator Waters' question, and I would ask you to give her the respect of listening to the answer. Senator Waters, second supplementary. Uh, thanks, President. That also conveniently avoided talking about the public money that this government uses uh, to give to coal and gas industries. Um, Minister, in August of 2019, you told ABC Insiders, in response to a question about Pacific Island concern on Australia's push for more coal and gas, um, you said that coal is an important industry for Australia. Is this still your view? Minister Wong. I, I, think, I, I think that anybody who has looked at the history of Australia and at Australia's current export profile will know uh, the, the monetary value that coal has provided to all of us and has funded a lot, has funded a lot of the public infrastructure, including those things that you wish for, you know, Medicare and so forth. But, but the point is, as the world moves to 2050, it is inevitable that we will have to ensure that we export goods and services into a global market that is a net zero market. And so that means we have to transition our economy to do much more 
uh, uh, for the new economies and the cl uh, clean energy economy than we have in the past. Uh, so rather than just trying to make one industry and those who work in it and vilify those who work in it, which is what the Greens political party do, what Order. I want to do and what we want to do is transition our economy so our children get the chance to, to have the prosperity we have had, but on the uh, basis thank of you, the Minister clean Wong. energy and net zero has expired. economy. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Watt. Minister, the Bureau of Meteorology and the CSIRO have today released their State of the Climate report, which states that the climate has warmed by 1.5 degrees from the start of the 20th century. Can the Minister explain how this will impact on communities and the emergency management sector? Uh, once again, Senator Rennick, if you wish to make a contribution, there are many other opportunities during the week for you to do so. I would ask now that you stop interjecting. Minister Watt. Senator Wong. Senator Wong, order. Order. Uh, Senator Wong, Senator Wong, I'm going to ask you to withdraw that comment. It's defaming. Senator Wong, I've asked you to withdraw that comment. That he's a coward. Uh, Senator Wong, it is not appropriate to repeat. I withdraw. Thank you. Senator Wong. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Smith. I know that. Um, I know that you're very concerned about what the flooding that we're beginning to see in South Australia, along with Senator Grogan, Senator Wong and Senator Farrell, and we're all very concerned about what might lie ahead for your state and we'll certainly be there with you all. Uh, today, the Minister for Science and Industry, uh, Ed Husick, and the Minister for Environment and Water, Tanya Plibersek, released the State of the Climate Report 2022, and it is an extremely sobering read. This report, prepared by two of Australia's leading climate research agencies, the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology found changes to weather and climate Order, extremes are happening. Rice. I'll remind you there are opportunities during the week to have to make a contribution. Question time is not it. Senator Watt. Thank you, President. And it is sad that even when we have a government that is serious about doing something about climate change and is in here talking about it, the Greens want to just carry on with their usual stunts. So this report does show uh, that we are experiencing changes to weather and climate extremes that are happening at an increased pace across Australia. Australia's climate has warmed on average by 1.47 degrees since national records began in 1910, and the impacts are being experienced across the country. While Australia has always been known as a land of drought and flooding rain, the past five years have been beyond anything we have seen in our history. And this, show, this report shows an increase in extreme heat, extreme heat events, intense heavy rains, longer fire seasons and sea level rises. We have lurched from prolonged drought into the black summer bushfires and now the unfolding flood and storm situation that is impacting across Australia's southern and eastern states. The report found that continued increasing temperatures are leading to more heat extremes and fewer cold extremes. And what this means is an increase in the number of dangerous fire weather days and longer fire danger seasons across southern and eastern Australia. We can also expect to see more heat waves, and heat is already our most dangerous natural hazard, killing more people than all other hazards combined. And I want to acknowledge the work between the Bureau of Meteorology, emergency management agencies and the Departments of Health for the national implementation of the Australian Warning you, System Senator for Watt, Heat. Your time has expired. Senator Mariel Smith, a first supplementary. Thank you. Minister, how is the government working to improve how we prepare communities ahead of and during these more intense heat, fire and flood events? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, Senator Smith. Uh, and this government is always going to be standing shoulder to shoulder with communities when disasters hit by providing the necessary support to help them respond and recover. But by better preparing for natural disasters, we can protect lives and livelihoods and lower damage bills from floods, fires and cyclones. Last night in this place, the legislation to create the Disaster Ready Fund was passed. That was an election commitment of the Albanese government, and now we've delivered. The de this fund was also confirmed in last month's budget, with up to $1 billion made available over the next five years for important disaster mitigation projects. We also know that the most effective way to assist Australians struggling with insurance costs is to better safeguard properties from the impacts of natural disasters. This fund will provide up to $200 million per year 
to invest in mitigation projects like flood levees, cyclone shelters, fire breaks and evacuation centres around Australia, funds that were previously locked away by the Coalition in their failed emergency response fund. In the meantime, we're also helping Australians recover from the current floods, thank having you, spent— Thank you, Senator What Your time has expired. As Senator Smith, second supplementary. Thank you. Minister, please tell us what could previous governments have done differently to have prevented these now extremely concerning global warning, warming trends? Minister Watt. Thank, thank you, Senator Smith. And before addressing that, I might just mention that uh, since January, some 2.9 million people in Australia have accessed more than $3 billion in Australian government disaster recovery payments and $195 million provided through the Disaster Recovery Allowance Program. But you asked what could previous governments have done differently. Well, firstly, the Coalition could have at any point over the past decade acknowledged that climate change was real. Instead, we saw 10 years of government-led climate wars, we're into the, the 11th year now, it would appear, that held our country back, exposed Australians to risk and made us an international disgrace. And with Senator Rennick and Senator Canavan still in the party room, still showing today they have learned absolutely nothing, that they still don't believe the science, we know that the coalition will still never come around on the uh, basic science. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, order. Order. Uh, Senator Rennick, I'm sh sure I don't. Order. 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 Those on my right. I have a senator on his feet. Senator Rennick, I'll also remind you, you don't start your point of order until I call. Senator Rennick. Uh, that was a personal reflection under section 193.3. Could you please retract that remark? Thank you. I, in the science. Uh, the mention of two senators, is that what you're referring to? It wasn't Name? a personal reflection. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Um, Minister Watt, please continue. Thank you. Uh, and, and as I say, what we've heard even today from Senator Rennick and Senator Canavan among their colleagues shows that nothing has changed. There are so many things this, the former government could have done. It could have spent a single cent from its emergency response fund on just one disaster mitigation project you, Senator instead Watt, of just your time earning interest. Has expired. Um, Minister Wong. And I apologise for not hearing you previously. Um, I, and I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Oh, are you on a? I'll just wait for the deputy. Presenting the minister for minister for infrastructure, transport, regional development, and local government, Minister Watt. As to why an answer to questions on notice number 543 has not been provided to the chamber. I'll give you the call, Senator Watt, in a moment. Let's just let the chamber clear. Can, can honourable senators please leave the chamber if they they're deciding to do so, Senator Watt? Uh, thank you, Deputy President. <clears throat> um, I apologise. I didn't hear the question numbers that uh, Senator Mackenzie referred to, but I think it was 543. Um, I understand that answer has been tabled, but for the avoidance of doubt, uh, here's another copy that I'm happy to table now. Senator Chandler. Um, thank you, Mr. Act uh, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of all answers to questions asked by opposition senators during question time. Thank you. Please proceed. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy President. And we had um, quite an interesting question time today. Lots of talk of psychics and spiritual healers and shamans and the like. And I, I couldn't help but wonder with all of this talk of seeing into the future if only the government had had a crystal ball back in May because then they might have actually foreseen some sort of semblance of an economic plan that they could uh, bring to the Australian people to try and solve some of these very difficult problems that we currently see uh, before us. Because throughout the election campaign we heard on multiple occasions the now Prime Minister, Mr Albanese and his Labor colleagues tell Australians that they cut the cost of living, 
But the, listen, um, uh, and they told everyone that um, your household costs would come down and your wages would go up. Uh, they promised that Australians would see a $275 reduction on their power bills. Not a subsidy or a concession or a one-off payment. They said that's what your power bills would go down by. Yet in the recent budget, Labor itself is forecasting power price rises of more than 30 per cent. And, Mr Deputy President, Labor's IR bill will only add to those cost of living pressures. Yesterday, media outlets reported that food manufacturers and distributors warned that the government's IR legislation would push up grocery prices and further worsen the cost of living crisis. It is clear that Labor's IR changes will adversely affect hundreds of thousands of Australian businesses, and we know that small businesses are going to be hit the hardest. Instead of thinking about hardworking Australians who own and operate the small businesses around this country, and instead of focusing on delivering cost of living relief to Australians before Christmas, which we know is on its way, the government's only focus is giving the unions an early Christmas present. It's quite amazing uh, how quickly Labor's tone changed after they won the election and took office. In the election campaign, it was all about reducing the cost of living. And as soon as they were elected, all we've heard from the Treasurer is commentary on how bad the global economy is, how none of it's their fault, and a pursuit of the niche issues to appease their union mates. The Labor Party was more than happy to attack the former government for economic conditions right through three years of the worldwide COVID pandemic. But now, after being elected, all we hear is an attempt to set a narrative that nothing is their fault. It's the war in Ukraine. It's inflation in the United States and the United Kingdom. It's international supply chains. Governing is about dealing with these events. Sometimes it is hard, but you have to deal with them. That is your responsibility. Yet after waxing lyrical about how they're going to reduce the cost of living, Australians have been left fuming at the lack of action from this government, which is now pursuing legislation in the form of an IR bill that will only deliver higher cost of living pressures Sorry. for Australian families and for Australian businesses, Mr Deputy President. Um, because as we heard today, the Albanese government's own regulatory impact statement, if it's to be believed, shows that Labor's legislation will cost small businesses uh, more than $14,600 in bargaining costs, including consultancy fees, uh, however calculated. For medium-sized businesses, that cost is going to be more than $75,000. But we know the actual cost could, be, in fact, be much higher than that. And let's not forget, according to the government, that a medium-sized business is defined as having any more than 15 employees. The question remains, how is the government going to respond to the challenges of the day and deliver on the hard and fast promises they made to cut the cost of living for Australians? Because, like I said, Mr Deputy President, there was no shortage of promises made by Labor to do so. Australians didn't hear the Labor Party saying, well, we'll cost the, cut the cost of living as long as the war in Ukraine ends and as long as the US economy is strong and everything else is well around the world. They said that they would cut the cost of living. Lower your power bills by hundreds of dollars, not raise them by 40 per cent and then hopefully take a few dollars off down the track. And Australians definitely didn't hear the Prime Minister or Labor propose these radical industrial relations laws because they never took this policy to the last election. It amounts to another broken promise from Labor. Labor's changes will mean a weaker economy. Labor's changes will mean higher cost of living pressures for Australian families. And Labor's changes will put the interests of union bosses ahead of hard-working Australians and our economy. Because Labor is more than happy to leave our construction industry and its more than 400,000 small businesses at the mercy of the militant CFMEU. By abolishing the ABCC, Labor have opened the door for more strikes, fewer jobs and unprecedented access to small business, and it will have a devastating impact on our economy, resulting in high business costs. Addressing the cost of living Thank pressures you, don't even register anymore. Senator Shikoni. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Well, it is fascinating to watch the coalition try and work out their political tactics today um, in question time, particularly on the secure jobs, better pay bill. Uh, they want to use question time and uh, many um, mechanisms within this chamber to, to push forward their scare campaign about the industrial relation changes that this government is rightly trying to implement. But as soon as Minister Watt uh, began answering uh, their questions, and, and quite rightly making the comparison between Labor's record and our approach to industrial relations, 
uh, and that of the previous government, you could barely keep up with the coalition senators um, interjecting, popping up, trying to prevent uh, the minister from actually answering the question. Now, we all know why those opposite don't want us to make this comparison, because it does start to remind the Australian public of their track record, of what they are ashamed about on their industrial relations reforms in this country, and so they should be. For the past 10 years, under the previous government, uh, Australia's enterprise bargaining system has been in decline. Around half, of, uh, around half as many new agreements were made last year as they were in the 2013-2014 financial year. The coalition policy of deliberately suppressing wages, their words, not ours, has had a devastating effect on working people. And have they abandoned this policy? Well, clearly not, because they are not doing everything they can to ensure that the workers deserve the pay rises that they have been screaming out for for the last decade. That is why the Labor Party, since it's come to government and into the lead up to the last election, has made it crystal clear of our efforts to get wages moving again. The coalition cannot even decide what scare campaign they want to run. Some members of the opposition are arguing that there is no proof that the bill gets wages moving again. But you know, the Leader of the Opposition has been on the record in the other places saying that he is scared that the bill will start to prompt wages growth above and beyond inflation. Um, it is important to also note that those opposites uh, could also learn a thing or two from the union movement. Because, quite frankly, uh, with the experience that a number of Labor members on this side have had, uh, the, the fact is that the collapse of bargaining over the last 10 years has led directly to the loss of wage growth for Australian workers, um, Deputy President. Every incremental increase in bargaining coverage will result in meaningful wage increases, according to many researchers, but particularly a new study from the Centre for the Future of Work. The study shows that every percentage point of bargaining coverage lost since 2013 has resulted in a drop in wage growth of around 0.1, of, of around, uh, 0.15 per cent. The OECD average for bargaining cover, coverage in countries with enterprise and some limited multi-employer bargaining is around 33 per cent. So if this bill that is before, at some, before the parliament and once it does come into the Senate here for debate, uh, manages to increase bargaining coverage to this level, the level that is seen right across many OECD countries, the report predicts that a corresponding 1.6 per cent increase in wages growth will occur every single year. This increase will mean $1,473 per pay rise for the average work in the first year. And I think that is a really good start, and that is the whole intent of the Albanese government about trying to not ensure that there are greater secure jobs in this country, but to have jobs that have well-paying, uh, well-meaningful wage rises that we have not seen over the last 10 years. Uh, but what we did see too when we first came in, that the previous government uh, refused to actually put in a, uh, a submission to the Fair Work Com Commission that supported meaningful wage rises for workers. So one of our very first acts as a government was to write to the Fair Work Commission advocating, advocating for wage rises to the very, very many millions of Australians who are on our award system, the low paid of this country, the very people who were packing our shelves, were working around the clock to ensure that we had toilet paper and, and, and tissues at the last minute when we ran out of supply, the people that were on the front line defending our fellow Australians during the COVID pandemic. Remember those people, all those people that we come in here and talk about and say how great of a job they're doing, but those opposite refused, refused to ensure that their wages keep growing. Senator Deputy Coney. President. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. The uh, concern that we have with the bill that the government's putting forward and the way they've responded to the questions is that there seems to be a lack of understanding that it is not so much government and government programs, but it is small business who are the predominant employers of people in Australia. And that means that for a business to be able to employ people to pay good wages, 
Uh, the business has to be profitable, and the business owner, who is often stumping up uh, their own capital, often putting their own house on the line uh, to get the capital to invest in their business, need to have the confidence that they'll have some control, some rapport with their workforce, and to be able to set conditions that are good for both the employees and for the employer. Now, one of the problems with what's being proposed here that this is a massive change to our industrial relations system that strips the small business owner and their direct employees, who generally they actually have a good relationship with because they tend to work as a team, it strips that relationship away and puts it in the hands of unions who are representative bodies who have no relationship often with the actual business and their workforce. Now, one of the concerns with this is that this is a change that takes us back some three decades. Uh, it actually undoes some of the very productive reforms that previous Labor governments uh, have put in place. And as we look at the rush here, it's worth remembering that governments who get elected on the basis of a policy position that's been argued, that's been considered, has been put to the Australian public, there is some grounds for them to rush things through if they believe it's really important and the Australian people have actually given them a mandate. But in this case, it was not an election commitment. It wasn't discussed before the election. There is no commitment. And even independent uh, media outlets are highlighting uh, the fact that it's reasonable to ask why the rush. Uh, in the editorial in The Australian Today, it asks why the rush. And it talks about the evidence of the haste in that the department in seeking to rush this through and provide an evidence base, has actually reached out to sources that even the minister admitted were not wise. In fact, they're quite laughable. So the source for how much business could be expected to pay to enter a multi-employer agreement, uh, the source which is quoted by the department describes themselves as a cross between a business strategist, modern day spiritual healer and a self-development expert. It's hardly the kind of robust basis the policy should be developed uh, in Australia. The editorial from The Australian goes on to highlight the high costs to business, some $14,500 to small businesses, up to $75,000 for medium-sized businesses, and asks the question, why the rush? And I think that's a valid question, particularly when you look at the feedback that business is giving. So in my home state of South Australia, uh, Business SA as a representative body is highlighting the fact uh, that the, there are a number of red flags for the business and that currently uh, you can have bargaining, enterprise bargaining, where multi-employer bargaining can be done, where employers choose to bargain together, but in this case it can force people to bargain. And so businesses are at risk of being roped into agreements that they've not negotiated at all. And in fact, the employees may not want it, but they can be roped in because unions could reach an agreement with a few employers elsewhere and then extend the agreement to hundreds of other employees. The issue for business is that the Labor government don't appear to actually understand the impact of costs. And we see that even in their Powering Australia plan. Whilst Minister Bowen is saying that only sensible economists or sensible economists would support the wind and solar uh, transition that the government is pushing, again rushing. Uh, he ignores the evidence from independent experts, engineers and economists such as the OECD that have highlighted in a report released in April this year that power prices will only continue to rise and in fact rise exponentially as we constrain carbon emissions if we insist on relying purely on wind and solar. They have a place but the OECD has highlighted that wind and solar will not get us to net zero and that we do need to consider other options and unlike the assertions by Minister Boeing, the OECD and the IEA actually say the cheapest form of electricity is nuclear power. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, Deputy President, sorry. Uh, and uh, I thank the opposition uh, for their trifecta uh, of questions uh, served up on our Secure Jobs Better Pay bill. 
uh, and its regulatory uh, impact statement. Uh, and I thank them, of course, for their rigorous uh, examination uh, of the RIS for our bill. Uh, and I also thank them for making uh, patently clear uh, through their behaviour in the chamber today, which can really only be described as frantic uh, and frenzied behaviour in the chamber today, uh, that their opposition uh, to our bill has nothing to do with the details of the regulatory impact statement. Uh, their opposition to the bill has nothing to do with what we're trying to achieve uh, as a government for workers and businesses in this country. Uh, and their opposition uh, to this bill has everything to do with the coalition's absolute love for low wages in this country. Um, we all know that the Liberals just love low wages. Uh, we all remember uh, that low wages were a deliberate design feature of the previous government's agenda. Uh, and that is exactly what we are about changing. And when I think about why the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill is so important, some of the people that I'm thinking about are the early childhood educators who have come to this place year after year after year, telling us all their story about how hard it is for them to live on the wages that they earn. They have been coming here year after year and telling us uh, that $24 an hour caring for and educating and nurturing the next generation uh, is just uh, an insulting amount of money. They've been telling us uh, that the money is so low uh, in this profession that while they're doing work that they absolutely love, educating children, uh, many of them can't even afford to have their own. Uh, these workers, who are over 90 per cent women, they need multi-employer bargaining to actually get their wages moving. And I'm also thinking, uh, when I think about our bill, of the cleaners um, who do absolutely essential work, who go in at night after everyone else has gone uh, and clean toilets for a living um, and are proud to do that for a job. Uh, but what they can't stand for um, is earning wages that are so low that they just can't support themselves uh, and can't support their families. Wages like 20 bucks an hour. This is another group of workers who actually need multi-employer bargaining to get their wages moving. Now, the enterprise bargaining system has completely failed all of these workers uh, and failed their families too. Uh, and what educators and cleaners have in common is not just that they're low paid, uh, it's that they're employed in small workplaces where the workers uh, and also the employers just don't have the resources to engage in bargaining effectively. And if they could um, use enterprise bargaining, it would literally take decades to go enterprise by enterprise to try to get wages moving. Um, we can't wait that long. These workers can't wait that long. Australia can't wait that long to actually get wages moving in this country. So the system as it exists today just doesn't work. Um, workers know it, employers know it. Everyone who came to our job summit knows that the system that we have in place today just doesn't work. Uh, and it's why only 14% of Australians today are actually covered by enterprise agreements. It's why reform is needed. Uh, it's why wages have been flatlining for 10 years under the previous government. Uh, and again, it's why we need multi-employer bargaining uh, and why we're proud to present it to this parliament, uh, because we need to get wages moving in this country after a decade of those opposite. Um, so the problem uh, is not uh, that wages are going too far or too high right now in Australia. The problem is that they've not been moving at all. Uh, and these laws, they are about redressing the imbalance that has emerged over the past 10 years. The sky won't fall in, demand for workers won't dry up, uh, and it will not be the 1970s again. What will happen is wages will start moving. Thank you. Senator Napa, Timber Price. Thank you, Mr President. Um, Acting President, uh, we hear a lot from this government uh, with regard for its concern for everyday Australians, yet they can't seem to come up 
uh, with a plan to reduce the cost of living for everyday Australians. Uh, instead, we have a um, rushed piece of legislation. And what does rushed legislation look like? Well, it looks like, um, it looks like inaccurate bargaining costs. It looks like a government that cannot demonstrate um, that it is able to produce accurate costings for small and medium business using its own formulas. I mean, is it 75,148, you know, already a, an expensive cost for medium business or more accurately, more than $80,000 um, for medium business? <laughs> what else does uh, a rushed um, red legislation look like? Well, it looks like um, Google as a research tool for relying on, um, relying on shamans to strategists, psychics to sales reps, uh, healers to homemakers, Buddhists to businessmen, and med meditators to mediators to develop its policy on the run. And a minister who is uh, clearly prepared to throw his department under the bus uh, when he's called out for his unreliable research tactics. So uh, we're hearing a lot about accusations of um, scare campaigns and scare tactics and terminology such as frantic and frenzied. Well, there are, there are business people out there who are very, very concerned about what the impacts of this legislation means for them, the cost that it means for them. Uh, there's this talk about, uh, you know, this, is, this, this legislation is about supporting workers. Well, don't we have to support the business people that employ workers to ensure that the business people can appropriately support their employees? Otherwise, these individuals may, be, may well be without a job uh, in the end because we're hearing from business people, small to medium business owners, that uh, this legislation may, may impact them to the point where they have to lay off some of their workers, where they have to close the doors entirely on their businesses. Uh, so yes, there is reason uh, for concern uh, and, and this government has to recognise that that is the case. Um, you know, th 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 this is not an exercise about increasing wages. This is an exercise about handing over workplaces to the unions, of course. You know, one such industry, the mining industry, that every single one of us rely on for everything to do with our everyday lives, um, not to mention um, to support this rush toward renewables by this government. The mining industry is certainly an industry uh, that impacts the, pe the people of the Northern Territory where I come from, and um, in, in a many number of ways. It needs to be understood that the industry itself already delivers a average annual pay rises of more than the CPI, with some companies increasing salaries uh, of employees by 7.8% above uh, state inflation rates. Um, you know, these proposed workplace changes is, is, is a radical shape up, a shake up of Australia's industrial relations system um, in, in decades. And if, if we want to look further into what it means, certainly um, for the mining sector, there is concern that this is this is going to lead to um, <laughs> lead to strikes, widespread strikes within the within the mining industry. You know, it has the potential um, to relate to, of course, the similar sorts of strikes as we've seen in the 1970s. Um, it threatens the mining industry in that it earns over 413 billion in exports and it employs over 277,000 Australians in high paid jobs already and contributes 43.2 billion in taxes. And this was in 2021. This is an industry that supports Australians across the board. Uh, in the last 20 years, employment in mining has tripled and, of course, wages have doubled, benefiting thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of Australians, especially in regional areas. And as I mentioned, the mining companies themselves are saying these changes will slow down Australia's energy transformation uh, that we need for lithium, batteries, more copper for solar panels, more cobalt for electric vehicles, not more uncertainty and risk that will simply chase away, certainly, investment to our shores. Um, Thank you, Senator Nambit, Chair Price. I'll just put the question first, Senator Thorpe, and then I will come give you the call. 
put the question to the motion moved by Senator Chandler. Those for the question say aye. Against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Thorpe, you wish to take note of an answer? I do. Thank you, Deputy President. I note the minister's, uh, Minister Watt's response to racially motivated violence against First Nations kids was to actually talk about youth justice as if our kids are the problem. We're talking about adults perpetrating violence against our children in this country. The world knows about Cassius and everyone was touched by that disgusting, uh, violent, racial attack. Even the PM knows about Cassius. But what about all the other children? In August, a 49-year-old woman mowed down two Aboriginal boys with her four-wheel drive, leaving one, Ronaldo Penny, in a coma for six days with a fractured skull, swelling and bleeding in the brain and a broken femur. He will carry these injuries for the rest of his life. In October, a 21-year-old man assaulted 15-year-old Cassius Turvey and a 13-year-old friend who was on crutches. Cassius was beaten to death. The 13-year-old was assaulted and racially vilified before his attacker stole his crutches. One week later, you didn't hear about this in the media, one week later, Leon Sutton Pickett and his 14-year-old brother-in-law were hunted down in a four-wheel drive, then assaulted with metal poles. This is in the great country called Oz, isn't it? Horrifically, the details of all this violence are similar. Homemade weapons, racial slurs and claims of mistaken identity. These predators know exactly who we are, Aboriginal people on Aboriginal land. For First Nations people, the violence doesn't stop with the assault. We then have to face a racist police network who either don't care or actively contribute to the violence. When Leon was attacked, Police attended the scene. Get this. No one was arrested. Leon told officers that he wanted to press charges and the police said that they were too busy. In November, 13-year-old Jaden Abraham was mauled by a police dog. 13-year-old Aboriginal child mauled by a police dog. He suffered severe injuries to his face neck and arm. The Aboriginal Legal Service of Western Australia has called out the disproportionate use of police dogs on First Nations people. In the last year, police dogs were used against First Nations people in 61 per cent of cases. We know why this is happening. People brag about it online. I quote, the dogs would have a fat time munching their bones. Baseball bat or large bolt cutters have more than one use. Find them and start cutting hands off. This is barbaric and it's unacceptable. And what's the Prime Minister saying about that? Call it what it is, racially motivated terrorism. People are getting radicalised online, which leads to violence on our streets, and the police are part of the problem. Black lives matter. Our babies matter. What's the Albanese government going to do about it? What's the McGowan government going to do about it? Because all of these attacks happened in Western Australia. Labor has the power to protect our babies at the state and federal level. So do something. It's all talk and no action, Labor. Oh, wait, it's on the agenda for the Attorney General, but it's been on the agenda for 200 years. 
Act on what we're telling you. Ban unmuzzled police dogs. Release all body cam footage when families ask you to. And stop hiding the truth. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it.